12, we'll read our text, and we were right in the middle of it last uh, Wednesday night, and we didn't get to finish, and so we're going to attempt to 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 finish it tonight, but uh, we'll see how far we get. We're reading the first two verses of Romans chapter 12, and uh, we're looking at this matter of presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. And last Wednesday night, we looked at what does this mean? And so we walked through verse 1 and explained the text and defined the terms and brought in the, the, the biblical context of it. And we wound up in Luke chapter 9 and, and getting a fuller meaning of what it means to present your body a living sacrifice. So this is where we want to pick up tonight. So let's read Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, and mainly emphasize verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So back in verse number 1, we, uh, we, we've been looking at this meaning. And to present your body a living sacrifice. And he says in doing so that it would be holy... And it would be acceptable unto God. And he says, which is your reasonable service? And this is the, the Christian life in the nutshell. Uh, when we present our bodies, we give ourselves to God. And that's essentially what it means to be saved, is that the sinner is awakened to his need for Christ, and he's willing to die to himself die to sin and come to Christ and spend his life bearing a cross and following Jesus Christ until Jesus calls him out of this world. And in doing so, in you presenting yourself to God, God's going to make you holy. And God is going to accept you on the basis of the merit of Jesus Christ. Now what we have... Uh, so much assumption is that if you don't do these external things, then you're holy. Well, in, an, in, a, in a sense, yes, but in another sense, my holiness is filthy rags compared to Christ's holiness. Amen. My best day of life is still falling short of God's glory. So we need His righteousness. We need His holiness. And my dear friend, none of the, the good works that we do in this life will ever accumulate to acceptance with God. The only basis of our acceptance by God is that we've been to Calvary. We've been born again. We've been saved by the grace of God. The blood's been applied. His righteousness has been imputed to our account. And therefore we stand justified because of Christ. We're holy because of Christ. We are accepted by God because of Jesus Christ. And, and then Paul says, this is your reasonable service. So let's go back to where we left off, which was in Luke 9. I'm, I'm a, I'm a how-to kind of guy. I want to know how it works. It's, it's good to know what it means. But we, we're, we're in an age of information. We, we're, we're in an age that people know what it, what it says, but they just don't know what it means. I, I want to know what, what does this mean and how does this look in everyday life? Isn't that the whole point of why we come here? I want to know what the truth is. But I'm not satisfied with knowing the truth. I want to obey the truth. I want the truth to be head and shoulders of everything else in my life. I want to be a Bible-believing, Bible-obeying Christian. And so when at the end of my life, I want to know that I've, I have ultimately become what God wanted me to be. Amen. Yeah. And the only way to do that is to ask these hard, difficult questions that... So often we'll, we'll, we'll look at these texts such as Luke 9 and Luke 14 and we'll say, 
Well, you know, yeah, we know what it says, but let, let's go, let's get on to the good stuff. No, I need to, I need to live here for a little while. I need to resonate here long enough for this truth, the truth to become a reality to me that it overtakes my life and I submit and I surrender myself to what this Bible has to say and what God demands. And so tonight I want to look at the demands of the gospel and we're just going to read it. We dealt with it last Wednesday night. We'll do a quick overview. But Luke 9 verse 23. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Jesus is speaking here, and it, my Bible says the heading here, the true cost of discipleship. And verse 23 says, And He said to them all, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow Me. Amen. Now, we... A couple of years ago, there was a man going across America that was had this big wooden cross and it had two wheels on the bottom. He was carrying that cross all across America and everybody made a big whoop about it. That's not what it means to take up your cross and follow Jesus. <laughs> That's not what it means. Taking up your cross and following Jesus ain't wearing one around your neck or carrying one in your pocket. We're too superstitious. Taking up your cross and following Jesus is you dying to who you want to be. Amen. And realizing what I want ain't what Jesus wants. And I'd rather have Jesus than have what I want, so I'm going with Jesus. Amen. That is the essence of the gospel. This is what happens when God saves a sinner. They, they don't care about themselves anymore. They just want Jesus. No wonder they call true disciples fanatics. Because we are. We want Christ. And he says, if any man will come after me. And Jesus is preaching this. He's got a crowd following him. He, he knows they're professing faith in him. Yeah, we believe in you. We believe in your miracles. You've been feeding us. You've been doing all these things. You're healing the sick, raising the dead. Sure, we want to follow you in case that ever befalls us so you can help us out. That's why they were following him. And he says, oh boys, let me tell you something. I'm going to preach to you. You like my miracles. Let's see how you like my message. <laughs> oh, yeah. Y'all like the meals I feed you, but let me tell you about my message. This is separating the sheep from the goats. And he says, if you want me, you're going to have to deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. Notice he didn't say, I, I went to the altar one time and prayed a prayer. That's it. He says daily. Every day the Christian is dying to live. We are dying to live. Paul speaks of it multiple times and that's where we will get to hopefully by the end of the night. If not, we'll get to it when we get to it. I'll put it that way. So he says, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now follow me simply means Jesus is head. Jesus is one. Jesus is in charge. Jesus is both. He's the leader and I'm the follower. But we have a big problem in our day is that we all want to lead. We don't want to follow. Well, you can't follow. You can't lead until you learn how to follow. And so Christ is telling him, you need to come after me. You need to follow me. And the only way you can do that is you're going to have to deny yourself and take up your cross. And this is the gospel message. This is the gospel. This is what Christ demands for those who will come to Him. Because notice in verse 24, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Now who can save his life? What does that even mean? It ain't actually... Somebody saving themselves. This is somebody saying, I will not let go of what I want. 
And Jesus said, okay, oh boy, if that is the way you want it, you are going to lose your life. You are going to perish because you don't want me. You want what you want and you want God to get on board with what you want. And at the end of your life, you are going to not have abundant life. You're not going to have eternal life because at the end of your life, it's, it's been all about you. And he says, if you save your life, you're going to lose it. But then he says in the next verse, whoever will lose his life for my name's sake, the same shall save it. That's interesting. That's a far cry from what most people call the gospel in America. If you come to Jesus, He'll save your marriage. If you come to Jesus, He'll pay your house off. If you come to Jesus, you won't get sick. Y'all know I'm telling it right. That's what we're hearing and that's what a lot of people sending over to these third world countries... This prosperity gospel is crept in our Baptist churches whether you like to admit it or not. You get to say, something good's about to happen and we love it. But what if something good ain't about to happen? What if you're about to go through the greatest valley of your life you're fixing to get a bad diagnosis and you're fixing to get diagnosed with cancer and you don't know if you're going to live in six months or not from now and Where's your Jesus at now? Did, he li- did they lie to me? They told me if I come to Christ, I have the best life I, I could ever possibly live. And ever since I come to Christ, it seemed like I'm fighting hell by the... Ding, ding, ding. The church has lied to people. And that's why they're not staying. Because you didn't let Christ save when you tried to save them. And that's the problem. This is, this is what it means to give your life to Christ. God, here I am. Whatever you want, you do. No questions asked. You're God, I'm not. And I'd far rather trust your leadership than trust my own. Because I tell you, I lived 20 years trying to do it my way. And I made a horrible mess of my life, but I'm glad Jesus came. He redeemed me from the mess I was in. I still got a mess. But I'm glad it's just temporary. One day the mess is getting left and I'm leaving out of here and I'm going to be with Christ and I'm going to have a glorified body and what a day it's going to be to be without sin, to be without Satan, to be without all the sorrows and the sufferings and despairs of life that we face day in to day out. I mean the Worst thing we can never tell a sinner is that, you know, you got everything else coming for you. If you'll just come to Jesus, like I'm going to put the cherry on top for you. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. Notice, let's look on down in verse 9. We're just briefly going to hit this and, and get into chapter 14 of Luke to further see about how this plays out. Look in Luke 9.57. Jesus is still preaching to the crowds that's following Him. He has done healed a a man's son who had a demon. The disciples couldn't cast the devil out. Christ had to do it. And then He deals with the crowd again in Luke 9.57. It says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto Him, Lord, now this is interesting. The Lord didn't go to this man. This man came to the Lord and said, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Mm Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Sounds like Simon Peter. I'll follow you to death. And the Lord says tonight before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. It's amazing how our human pride and ego... We'll follow you, Jesus. They done heard the message. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. Or we'll follow you wherever you go. He said, okay.
okay, well, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but I, the Son of Man, have nowhere to lay down my head. Oh. So you mean tell me, here's the Son of God that's been doing all these miracles and wonders, and the Son of God denied Himself. He took up His cross to do the will of the Father. The King of Glory came here. There was no room for His birth. And He had no home here in this world. You want to follow me? I don't even have a place to call my own here. How would we like to have that message preached? Everybody wants them to know what Jesus will do for you. What Jesus can give. Let me tell you what. He'll, he'll save your soul from your sins. Amen. Amen. That's right. Thank you, Lord. He will teach you how to be content with whatever you have in life. Amen. Amen. Yes, he will. He'll teach you that a $5 pair of shoes from the Salvation Army wear just as good as the $200 pair of shoes. <laughs> Christ will teach you it's not about things, it's about having Him. Yes, amen. God didn't forsake Jesus, but He just let Him know there's some material things Jesus done without while He was here on earth. But you ask most Americans, oh, you mean Jesus wants me to give up that? Well, I'm not going to do that. Exactly. You love you and you don't love Him. That's exactly what He's teaching us, folks. Look in verse 59. And He said unto another, now Jesus is speaking. He says, follow me. And He says, but He said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. If you do your study on this, this man's dad isn't dead. And he said, Lord, just let me hang around and spend time with my dad till he's gone. And after dad is gone, then I'll go preach the gospel. He just said, Hey, let the dead bury their dead. You go preach the gospel. You go on. You go on and serve me. He had this me first mentality. Look in verse... 61, and he said unto and another also said, Lord, I'll follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my house, at, at, at home, at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That is... Don't say I'm a follower of Christ and look back and want to go back to your old life. And he said, if that's you, if it's in your heart to go back to where you were before Jesus found you, you you're not fit. You hadn't been fitted. Your heart has not been changed. Amen. When God saves you, He changes your desires. You don't want to live where you used to live. You don't want to be who you were prior to Christ saving you through this work of regeneration. Let's go to Luke 14 now. You, do you see the significance of what Jesus is teaching about presenting your bodies as living sacrifices? And stuff? These are these gospel demands that Jesus would preach to these people that were following Him leaps and bounds and they didn't sit too well with these people in Jesus' day, and it really doesn't sit well today. But I want us to look in verse 15 of Luke 14, verse 15. There's two things I want us to see. I want you to see the parable that He's going to teach, verses 15 through 24. He's going to tell a story. And He's going to tell this story, and it's going to be... Uh, a story that you can relate to, but it's got a spiritual meaning to it. That's a simple definition of what a parable is. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning and application for us. It's more to it than what meets the eye. 
And then verse 25 through 32, he deals with the principles of the parable. And so he, he's going to tell this story and then he's going to talk about the significance of what this story actually means that we might miss, but he makes sure we don't miss it. So look in verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper, bade many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. Oh yeah. The first said unto him, I've bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. <laughs> I pray thee have me excused. Who buys land without first looking at it? That just stumps me. I'm trying to make my mind around this. Who's going to buy anything without first laying eyes? We, we buy things, but we see pictures. We, we get videos, or we actually put our hands on it. This man said, I bought a piece of land. I need to go see it. Pray you excuse me. You see the significance? Jesus has a table prepared. He's got a supper prepared. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And all across the world tonight and on Sundays and any given day of the week, God's people are out in the world. We're telling folks about the supper God's got ready. And we hear excuse after excuse after excuse. And this man's excuse was... I bought a piece of land. I need to go see it. I pray thee have me excused. Look at verse 19. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, <laughs> therefore I can't not come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. These three people that made excuses had health, they had wealth, they had everything everybody would ever desire. If you will, they're living the American dream. And everything they want to be excused for is the exact same thing Satan offered Jesus in the temptation. Amen. Uh-oh. Nothing wrong with having stuff, but it's a problem when stuff has you and keeps you from coming to Jesus. Oh, yeah. But I'm interested in what the, the Lord of the house now did say. You go out there and you get those people who ain't got nobody or nothing and don't even have the ability to get here themselves, you go bring them. Amen. Amen. Jesus didn't come to save the righteous. He come to call sinners to repentance. Amen. Yeah. So if you know how bad you are, and how hopeless you are without Christ, 
and you hear about what Christ has done for you. Oh, yeah. I can't. Will you help me? The servant's picking him up. Here's a picture of the Holy Ghost. He's going out in the world. And he's bringing us to Christ. Amen. What he done for Mephibosheth, what he done for these, is the exact same thing he done for you when he saved your soul and brought you into the family. Amen. Thank you. This is this is important for us to gather and to get a hold of. Here's people that don't have time for God. They're too interested in in land, oxen. I don't even know what to say about a man that married a wife and said, well, I just can't come. Um, I, that just blows my mind. But notice in verse 22, And the servant said, Lord, it's done as thou hast commanded. And yet there is room. There's room for one more. There's room for more than one. There's room for all who want Him. Any and all that want Him, there's room for you. But do you want Him is the question. That's the question. And notice what what He said in verse 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Now what did Jesus say later in John 14? In my Father's house. In my Father's house are many men. If it were not so, I would have told you. So I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. God's filling His house. One sinner at a time. (laughs) Woo! That'll help you. Look in verse... That's the parable. Now let's look at the principles. He's going to teach about it in verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him. So now he's got this great multitude, this great host of people that's with him. And he turned and said unto them. Now when I see Jesus' tactics, and I see what the American church is trying to propagate, Two opposites. Jesus didn't tell them what the people wanted to hear. He didn't do what he needed to do to make sure the great crowds kept following him. You know what he done? Every time a crowd got great, he turned around and preached to them. Amen. Amen. And the crowd got thin real quick. Yes, sir. People like miracles. People like meals. They just don't like the message. If you're hot dogging them in and ain't preaching to them, you might as well take church off your sign because you're not a church. That's right, man. We're not building the church off the Word of God and the Word of God alone. We're not a church. And I'm not going to stand for anything less than Bible church. Bible church. Now, this is amazing to me with what I grew up with and what Jesus is setting for us is totally different. Oh man, people say, well, man, you keep preaching like that, you're going to run them off. Well, Jesus done that. Because they really don't want Christ. Let me tell you something. If you... If, My wife can't run me off because I love her. And I can't run her off because she loves me. Now, if I can run you off from here, you really didn't love us to begin with. Amen. 
Amen. Hello. Yeah. This is not a business. Right. We're not using marketing strategies to build big buildings, have big bank accounts. and We're preaching the gospel because your life and your soul is more important than having this place full. Amen. And having a big bank account. And having more and more and more of this world's goods and don't have Christ when He's outside trying to get in. That's where He is at the close of the church age. In Laodicea, He's outside knocking on the door of the church wanting His people to hear Him and open up and let Him come in and let Him restore the church to what it's supposed to be. But notice what Jesus said in verse 26. If any man come to me. Boy, all right, so we're following Jesus. And he said, if you're going to come to me, and notice what he says, and hate not his father, mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. Acts 11.26 said the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The term Christian has seemed to take the word disciple and disciple is almost a forgotten word today. They were first disciples before they were called Christian. What is a disciple? A follower of Jesus Christ. So those that would truly follow Christ, regardless of what happened in life, they truly followed Christ they were called Christians by the word, world and that word Christian was a derogatory term in their day. They, the disciples didn't call themselves that. The world called them that and it meant you bunch of little Jesuses. Yeah. Amen. It was a derogatory term. Yeah. Yeah. It was like the disciples in the book of Acts it says that they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Y'all bunch of Jesus freaks. Y'all bunch of fanatics. So Jesus said, if you love anybody more than you love me, boy, this is a reality check. Yes, sir. You're not following me. Uh-oh. He says you can't be my disciple. If you don't love me, now we use this word hate and it means if you don't love Jesus more than you love your father and your mother and your wife and your children and brethren and sisters, most time we'll say, yeah, okay, but that last one is where it all, nobody loves you more than you. And Jesus said, if you don't love me, more than you love yourself, you can't be. I just cannot. Hmm. That's ability. It's, it's not can I go to the bathroom, it's may I go to the bathroom. We know you have the ability to go to the bathroom, you need permission. Jesus, you don't have the ability because your heart hasn't been changed, you're still lost. This is what Jesus is teaching. Discipleship is not optional. It is essential for being saved. This idea, man, I can get Jesus as Savior and not have Him as Lord and go to heaven, it's heresy. He's both Lord and Savior. And He's Lord before He ever was Savior. Always. Always. We don't mind sweet baby Jesus at Christmas time. But we don't want to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's this Lord business? I, I, 
You notice we got problem with authority today. Yeah, we have problem with authority. Everybody wants to be their own boss. Nobody's their own boss. No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. Whether we live, we are the Lord's, and whether we die, we are the Lord's. Yeah. Yeah. This is some very key things we need to comprehend. This is what the... So, well, that, that's too great. Absolutely. This is too great for us to even bear. This is why Christ came. This is why Christ done. Uh, come and He died and He rose and He put His Holy Spirit within our hearts that He's making us like Him. Amen. I mean, this stuff just does You don't wake up one morning and everything that the Bible says about being saved just happens. No, 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 no. This is called sanctification. It's the painful process where Christ is making us like Him. And it's taking a whole... It's a long time. It's very painful because He's the potter and we're the clay. He's over here pro poking and a prodding and sanding and He's getting the rough edges off. And that old hard clay, that, that, that thing we don't want to get, He's constantly poking and prodding at it. And finally, he do like He did with Jacob. He'll just wrestle with you and he, He's going to prevail. He may have to cripple you, but God's going to win. You're not going to stop God from doing what God wants. God's God and we're not. This is, what he, this is the essentials. Notice in verse 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So now he said another stipulation. If you don't love God more than anybody or anything else in this world, you can't be my disciple. And whoever, I'm glad he put that in there, the same whosoever invitation is the same whosoever declaration here. If you don't do this, you're not in. You're not my disciple. I don't know you. What Matthew 7 says, Lord, we've prophesied in thy name, we've cast out devils, and in thy name done many wondrous works. And Jesus says, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never, never knew you. The problem with our day, we got a lot of people professing to know Jesus, and Jesus don't know them. Amen. Right. Right. How do I know? By my life. Do I hate sin? Do I love Jesus? Let, let me just go back to this. Not do I hate sin. Do I hate my sin more than I hate everybody else's sin? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> we met him. We're going to plow a little bit right there. It's easy for us to look down on the world. and Nitpick on stuff we don't do anymore. Yeah, you'll shout me out when I preach on that kind of stuff. <laughs> so when I start talking about the sins of the saints, everybody gets mad and you get surprised because somewhere along the way you think you don't sin anymore. How dare you call me a sinner? I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I've been to Calvary and you hear the... The ego and the pride. I wonder if you've ever been strutting around like peacocks thinking, man, bless God, we're better than the world. The world needs what we have. And that kind of attitude lets me know you don't know anything of grace because you say, look what I've done. You didn't do anything but sin. Amen. Jesus done the rest. <laughs> Who am I? You would look on a dead dog like me. Who would you? Who am I that God would pass my way, call my name, save my wretched soul? Oh, we ought to be humble. Recognize His grace. 
Therefore, I don't have any problem denying myself. I don't have anything to boast about other than Jesus Christ. He saved me. I'm with Charles Spurgeon. My theology is wrapped up in this. Jesus died for me. He saved my soul. I was lost and undone without God in this world when He came by my way. Interrupted my life. And because He endured that cross, surely I can spend my lifetime following Him by doing whatever He wants of me. Denying myself and taking up my cross and following Him. Now verse 28 through 35, it really struck a chord with me. And, and this is all, we, we've got about three more weeks in this. But y'all just bear with me. I hope it's being a help to you. I don't want to rush through this. I hope we're getting these demands of the gospel that Jesus put forth to these crowds deep-seated in our hearts. Look at verse 28 through 35 real quickly. We'll bring this to a close. And, and I just want you to think about something or what Jesus is fixing to, to tell us here. And he's not talking about... And actually, he defends and speaks against people hastily making an emotional decision. Not being manipulated, not counting the cost, not thinking it through. Oh, God. Uh oh. Let's just read it. You'll see. For which of you, now he's talking to these people following, intending to build a tower, sit it not down first and count it the cost. Whether we have sufficient, meaning sufficient money, to finish it. How many of you have started off on a project? Us fellows, we have these. Our wives have honeydews. They want this. And the first step to being a good husband is you sit down and you calculate the cost and see whether it's in the budget to do it right now or not. Because if you get started on it and ain't got enough money to finish, she ain't going to let you alone until you get it done. And your life is going to be a rub till you get it done. Now, essentially, what Christ is talking about is following Him. And He's using this story about a man building a tower to relate to the people, make sure He's going to count the cost. I'm afraid the church has took a detour right here and told half the truth about following Jesus. And we didn't tell them what it's going to cost them. We tell them what it costs God to follow Jesus. But we ain't never good to tell them what it's going to cost them. So well, if you do that, they're not going to ask Jesus to save them. Is God really dealing with them then? Uh-oh. Whew. John 6, 37. All the Father giveth me shall come to me. Amen. And all that He gives... And all that come unto me, I'll in no wise cast out. So that lets me know I need to let God do the drawing. I just need to tell the message. The message is it's going to cost you. And it's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you your dreams, your ambitions, your goals to follow Jesus. It is. Notice verse 29. Let's happily, after he laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. All that behold it begin to mock him. <laughs> now let's think about this for a minute. How many people we know started well but ain't finished with us? Yeah. They didn't count the cost. I know people right now say, well, I come. That preacher told me if I come to Jesus, he'll save me. And my life would be better, but buddy, it ain't gotten better. It's gotten worse. And Everything that preacher promised me, I found out to be a lie, and I ain't got nothing that's made atheist out of them. Yep. You know why? Because you got lied to. Yep. 
by a silver tongued orator that's trying to turn the church into a business. <laughs> Manipulation strategies, raise your hand, repeat after me kind of business. Oh God. And it's gotten so bad that a guy out of the Burlington Revival, y'all remember the Burlington Revival CT preached? Well, there was a preacher, so called, got saved out of that meeting. Four days later, he surrendered to preach and immediately began to preach revival. He just held one here in the United States and he told that congregation, he said, if y'all don't repent, this is what he said, if y'all don't repent and get revival, God's going to raise up an axe murderer and he's going to kill your wife and kids. And he's going to watch you. You're going to have to watch your wife and kid get beheaded because if you don't repent, God told me this is your only chance to get right. And after this, it's over with. They're videoing this live stream. And he says, everybody that's lost, raise your hand. And the screen went black. You can't see it. Oh, I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Oh, yes, yes, I see that hand. And then after you got done all that nonsense, you come back on him. And he says, oh, you raise your hand. And you come down here. And the whole church got an altar. Well, who would you just threaten them if they don't get right with God? I tell you, I would have got up and left. He's a false prophet. That's right, man. That's right. God don't tell the preacher, if you don't get right, I'm going to send an axe murder to behead your wife and kids. Have you lost your mind? He's trying to get numbers. That's right. That's right. Numbers. He's trying to make himself look good. Jesus didn't use that. Oh. But if they're not able to begin uh, to finish what they start, they begin to mock him. And you know what? That's what the world's doing. They're making a mock out of those who started and didn't finish. Yeah. It didn't work for so and so. How you know it'll work for me? But look at those that it has worked for. Yeah. Look at verse 31. What king going to war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. He's causing people to think this through. You understand? This is how serious this is. This ain't a five-second decision. It's something you need to sit through, think this thing through. Verse 32, Or else, while the other is a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, listen to this. Now he's saying from verse 28 to 32, this is why I'm getting, I'm talking about you that are following me. And he says, well, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, Cannot be my disciple. My question is, what are you withholding from Jesus? If it's anything, according to this Bible we love, we're not disciples. You're not disciples. Can't be. Verse 34. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its savor, Wherewith shall it be seasoned? Can't. When salt goes bad, it can't be restored. Jesus says it's fit for the dunghill. Notice verse 35. It's neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out. He that hath ears, let him hear. You understand what Jesus is saying? If you're not my disciple, you're going to be cast out. It's amazing to me. That's the, that's the message Jesus decided to preach when He had a great crowd.
This is what it means. Present your body. All of me and all I have is yours, Lord. Whatever you decide to do with it, I'm satisfied. Because it ain't mine anyway. It all come from you. Amen. All right, let's stand to our feet. And uh, we'll be dismissed. Hope the Lord's helped you tonight. I